So I'm here to talk about the work that we've been doing as part of the Genome in a Bottle Consortium. Um, and this consortium is really aimed at answering the question, you've sequenced a genome, how well did you do when you sequenced? Um, and so this is done as part of a group at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, where I work, um, in collaboration with a large number of different academic and industry and government groups that are part of the Genome in a Bottle Consortium. So just to give an introduction to the types of things that we do at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, um, we have about 3,000 employees and about 1,800 scientists and engineers that work at NIST um, at a few different sites. The two main campuses are in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and in Boulder, Colorado. Um, but we also have a new site out here um, in the Palo Alto, California. Um, and our goal at NIST is really to be the world's leader in measurement solutions, and uh, these can take a number of different forms. Uh, I'm particularly in the material measurement laboratory at NIST, um, and this is, we're focused on the chemical, biological, and material sciences. Uh, and so we work with a wide variety of different groups. Uh, the, our group is called the Genome Scale Measurements Group, and so we work with a lot of different um, genomics types of measurements. Uh, I'm going to focus on one particular project that we have in our group um, that's we're done in collaboration with the Genome in a Bottle Consortium, uh, and that's focused on creating really well-characterized whole human genomes. Um, and these are reference materials, and what we mean by reference materials at NIST is really well characterized materials that people can use to understand the accuracy of their measurements or to calibrate their measurements. Uh, and so in this case, the, these reference materials are extracted DNA from cell lines um, and we characterize the sequence of that DNA as well as we can. So the motivation behind the work that we're doing in Genome in a Bottle is really to try to address the problem of this Venn diagram. And so this Venn diagram here shows five different bioinformatics tools, and these are all variant colors. Um, and they're all applied to the same exome sequencing data set, uh, but only about 60% of the variant calls agree between the five different colors. Uh, and so this was published a few years ago, and really the question that this raises is who is right in this case? So when they disagree with each other, who is right? And maybe even if they all agree with each other, is anyone right sometimes? So we formed the Genome in a Bottle Consortium a few years ago now. Um, it's hosted by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, where I work. Um, our goal is to provide infrastructure to assess confidence in human variant calls. Uh, so we're, our approach to doing this is finding some appropriately consented, widely available DNA samples that can be used by anyone um, as part of their sequencing process. Uh, these are distributed by the Coriol Institute for Medical Research, which is a nonprofit cell line repository. Uh, but we also distribute them as NIST reference materials. And, so, and the main difference between what's at Coriel and what's at NIST is that we've, take, we've worked with Coriel to grow up a very large batch of this, these cells, extract the DNA, um, and, um, and homogenize it as well as we can so that all of our vials contain basically the same DNA in them. And so you know that what you get from us today is the same DNA that you'll get from us five years from now if you buy the same reference material. Um, and then we're also working with the Personal Genome Project, or the PGP, um, and the nice thing about those samples is that the consent that process that they go through allows them to be commercially redistributed as well. Uh, and so there are several different companies that are producing uh, reference samples that are based on the same uh, cell lines that we're distributing as reference materials, um, but they can modify them in different ways, like putting them in formalin to sort of mimic what a can some cancer samples look like, um, or mixing them with synthetic DNA constructs that might have mutations in them. Uh, the other important thing that we're doing as part of Genome in a Bottle is developing some high accuracy reference data that people can use. And I'll talk more about the strategies that we've used to create this reference data. Um, this includes the raw data that we generate, but also the high confidence variant calls and regions where we think there is not a variant call inside the genome. Um, 
The other important part of, even after we have these really well characterized samples, is that um, it's not always trivial to compare your answer to ours when you've sequenced the same sample. And so we've been working with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, um, in particular the benchmarking team there, to develop some tools that can be used for benchmarking and understanding your, the accuracy of your variant calls. So the samples that we've selected as part of Genome in a Bottle, the pilot sample, which is available now as a NIST reference material, um, is often called NA12878. Um, this is the number that Coriel assigns to it. Um, and it's been part of many different projects over um, decades, actually. And so most recently, it's been part of the Thousand Genomes Project, but it's also been used by a lot of different laboratories as an effective reference sample even before we made it into a reference material. Uh, one of the nice things about this sample is that it's part of a large pedigree, and so there are um, 11 children that are part of this pedigree, and um, two different companies, Illumina and Real-Time Genomics, have done some interesting analyses where they've phased everyone in the pedigree and uh, looked for which variants inherit as you'd expect them to inherit in the pedigree, and if variants don't inherit as you'd expect them to be inherited, then there's a, a risk that those variants might be incorrect, and so they're able to get um, high confidence calls in that way. Uh, the next samples that we've been working on are two trios, and these are trios from the Personal Genome Project that I had mentioned. Uh, one of them is of Ashkenazim Jewish ancestry, and the other is of Han Chinese ancestry. Um, we're focusing right now on analyzing the Ashkenazim Jewish ancestry, and we've been collecting data on uh, both of these trios. Our plan is to make all three members of the Ashkenazim Jewish trio family uh, into reference materials, um, but probably only the son of the Chinese trio into reference materials. However, the parents of the Ch Chinese trio will still be available from Coriel and will still be characterizing them and we'll be using the information in the family to help make higher confidence calls um, and see which things inherit properly in those trios. Uh, so one of the important things to understand about reference materials is which parts of the process it, you're validating with the reference materials. Um, and so the process that we um, suggest using these reference materials in is you put this extracted DNA into your library preparation. Um, this means that you're not testing any of the pre-analytical steps, which include things like if you have a tissue, extracting the DNA from the tissue and uh, getting it ready for the library preparation. Um, so we're not testing those parts of the process, but we do test the bulk of the analytical process of sequencing, which includes library preparation or preparing the DNA to go on the sequencing instrument. It includes the sequencing itself. Um, and then it includes the bioinformatics steps of aligning the reads or mapping the reads to the reference genome and doing variant calls um, against the reference assembly. Um, and whatever confidence estimates you get out of that. Um, and then you compare your, uh, whatever, if you're a lab and you've sequenced this DNA, you compare your calls to our high confidence calls that we've developed. Um, and there's some magical comparisons that happen and you end up with, usually we say either a red light or a yellow light in the end. So. Um, since we're not testing the whole process, and because these reference materials may not test all of the different types of variants that you detect, um, we're not saying that everything is working perfectly fine and this is all you need to do to test your uh, process, but it does test part of your process, and if you get the wrong answer in a lot of cases, then you're getting a red light or you need to go back and sort of evaluate your process and understand where the errors are, are occurring. Um, the other thing, important thing to recognize is that the um, clinical interpretation steps that occur downstream from the variant calling are not really being tested by these samples. Um, these are nor relatively normal genomes, um, whatever that means. Um, and so, you, so they generally don't have diseases and you, we're not testing whether you can detect whether someone has a particular disease. Uh, but it does test sort of how well you're getting the variant calls before you do the interpretation.
So the process that we used to develop our high confidence calls was um, to integrate all of the data sets that were already publicly available for our pilot genome. And so there were um, at least 14 different data sets that were available for this genome publicly because it had been used so extensively already. Um, and these were from five different sequencing technology or sequencing platforms. Um, and we used those to establish our reference SNP and indel calls as well as homozygous reference calls or regions of the genome where there are not variants. Um, and so we published this a, f a couple years ago now in uh, a paper in Nature Biotechnology where we describe these methods. Um, and we ended up with about 77% of the genome being high confidence and about 23% of the genome being uncertain. Um, so the methods that we used to, to do this are outlined here. Um, and the, the idea is that we first take candidate variants from each of the platforms. And so this means that we want to sort of collect all of the possible locations where there might be a variant in the genome. Uh, that helps us narrow down the regions of the genome where we're looking so that we don't have to look in regions of the genome where it's clearly not a variant. But we want to at least evaluate um, where, where there might be a, a possible variant in the genome. Uh, the next step is to identify concordant variants where the different platforms agree with each other. Uh, and uh, that, those concordant variants we, are not what we put out there as high confidence variants, but we use them to train a machine learning model that identifies characteristics of systematic errors. So if you're familiar with the, sort of the bioinformatics process for next-gen sequencing, uh, there are a lot of different characteristics that people have developed to understand where, uh, where the sequencing data might be incorrect or giving you a, a false positive in your calls. Uh, these are things like uh, mapping quality score of the reads, so where the reads might not map with high certainty in that region, or where maybe only part of the read maps in a location. That might indicate that there might be a larger variant happening there that's um, that's not, a, and so it's not actually a small variant like what we're focused on here. Um, and so we use those characteristics of systematic error to arbitrate between the different technologies when they disagree. So if one data set looks like it's sort of a normal data set without any evidence of systematic error at that location, um, and the other data set has a has the, a variant that is, has some characteristics associated with error, then we wouldn't trust the one that has uh, abnormal characteristics or characteristics of uh, error there. Um, and so that sort of helps us to develop our high confidence calls even in locations where the technologies might disagree with each other at face value. Um, and then we also, to be sort of conservative in our first attempt at developing these high confidence calls, we also exclude regions that are potentially biased for all short reads. So we exclude a lot of the repetitive regions of the genome where just none of the technologies do very well right now because, uh, because the reads are too short or because there are a lot of systematic errors that occur in those regions. Uh, the other big category of things that we exclude are regions where people have purported to say that there are uh, structural variants at that location. And structural variants are larger variants that occur in the genome, and often there are artifacts that occur around um, these structural variants that make it look like there are small variants when really there aren't. Uh, so the way that we assign the confidence to the genomic regions, just to summarize what I was saying here, the high confidence calls, which are about 77% of the genome, these are places where the platforms agree or we understand the systematic biases that cause the disagreement between the platforms. Um, and at least some of the methods have evidence of, uh, have no evidence of systematic errors. So, um, so we don't want to include places where everyone has a systematic error. Um, and then uh, for the methods that use the pedigree information, they also will include places that are Mendelian inheritance consistent, so places that, will, that are inherited as you'd expect them to be. Uh, the lower confidence calls are regions that are known to be difficult for current technologies. So these are things like segmental duplications where there's a lot of homology between regions of the genome. Uh, repeats and low complexity regions, um, some of the really high-end GC, low GC regions where there's not sufficient coverage of the genome. 
Um, and then also this, these lower confidence calls also include places where there was evidence of systematic error across many platforms. So if none of the platforms could map reads with high confidence in that region, even if they all call a vari the same variant there, we still put that in the low confidence calls. Uh, so I, we've done some comparisons of the methods that I described um, here where we take uh, data from multiple sequencing technologies and we've compared those to the pedigree-based methods that I mentioned from the Illumina Platinum Genomes Project and from real-time genomics. Uh, and so the, these high confidence calls from the pedigree-based methods are those that are inheriting consistent with a phased pedigree. And so that by phasing, I mean that they determine which of the um, variants come from each of the parents in the pedigree. And so, um, so for each child, they know which region of the genome was inherited from the father and which region of the genome was inherited from the mother. Um, and that helps to weed out a lot of the systematic errors that can occur. Um, the Illumina Platinum Genomes Project integrated multiple Illumina callers as well as a complete genomics call set that they developed. Um, and they also have a bed file that describes their high confidence regions. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention is that for our high confidence calls, in order to describe which regions we are calling with high confidence, we have a bed file which describes the genomic regions where we're calling with high confidence. Um, and that's in addition to the places where we call variants in the genome. And so um, the Illumina Platinum Genomes Project does have a bed file. The real-time genomics one uses sort of a similar method, but they don't have a bed file that describes high confidence regions. They just tell you where your high confidence calls are. Uh, the strengths of these approaches are that they tend to cover more difficult regions of the genome that we're not able to make high confidence calls in when we're just looking at a single sample and um, integrating the different callers. Um, they also can identify systematic errors, particularly in homopolymer regions. So homopolymers tend to be difficult to sequence for most sequencing technologies or really all sequencing technologies. Um, and so this can, these methods can help to identify systematic errors where the homopolymers are not, the homopolymer variants are not inherited as you'd expect them to be. Uh, the weaknesses of the pedigree-based approach is that it tends to be difficult to define the high confidence regions. And so even though the platinum genomes has a bed file, it's often hard for them to precisely define where the, the breakpoints of the high confidence regions are. Um, and there are also some types of errors that can actually be inherited properly. And so, for example, if there's a structural variant in the genome, um, SNPs and indels around the edge of the structural variant can be inherited as you'd expect them to be because the structural variant is inherited as you'd expect them to be. Uh, one of the tools that we've developed in collaboration with the uh, NIH, or the NCBI at NIH, um, and also with the CDC is a genome browser. And so genome browsers allow you to look at genome sequencing data as well as um, other information that people have collected about regions of the genome. Uh, and so the nice thing about this genome browser is that there are a lot of data sets that are preloaded for you that have our reference material data in, um, in, in them so that for this NA12878 sample that we've been characterizing, there are a lot of different data sets that you can load into this browser and you can look to see what other people have gotten at that at a same location. So for example, if you disagree with our call at a location, you can go and see what, what these other clinical labs and research labs got at that location. And then you can even look at the reads themselves to see what types of variants are in the reads and whether there might be some sort of systematic error that's occurring um, at that location. Uh, there have been a lot of different uses of our uh, reference material, and we actually released the data from our reference material before we even released the reference material DNA itself, and a lot of people started using it before then. Um, people have used it for analytical validation of whole exome and genomes uh, sequencing, particularly in clinical labs. Um, people have also used it for bioinformatics development. So. Um, Often when you're developing a bioinformatics tool, it's really useful to have something to compare against that you can, so you can say what, 
whether um, you're getting most of the variants that are detected with high confidence by other methods or whether you're missing a lot of them, and also whether you have a lot of false positives that um, aren't actually true variants. Um, <clears throat> So most of this discussion so far has been about our pilot genome, NA12878. Um, we are also characterizing uh, two different trios from the Personal Genome Project. Um, this slide describes the data from our Ashkenazim Jewish trio. Uh, and we've collected a large variety of different data sets. So we have a lot of different long read, or sometimes they're called linked read technologies. Um, so PacBio is a long read technology where they can get reads that are on the order of 10 KB or even longer in size. Um, and, and we've generated probably the highest coverage um, data set on a trio for, for PacBio reads um, because we really want to be able to characterize not only the small variants that are occurring in the genome, but also larger variants. And these long reads can help with that. Um, we also have BioNano data, which is an optical mapping technology where you don't actually get sequence information, but you get sort of information about the distance between particular sequence motifs in the genome. And, and the advantage of this, that method is that you can get really long range information and so you can get information of places that are uh, within a 200 kilobase range or even longer sometimes. Um, so that can really help to describe some of the larger types of variants and, <coughs> and some of the more repetitive regions of the genome. Um, we also have some, some of these linked read technologies that I have mentioned. And so these are technologies where you're actually sequencing with short reads, um, but you know that all of the reads with a particular barcode came from the same longer region of the genome. So, so you have short reads that all come from, say, a 100 kilobase region of the genome. And so that can help you to resolve some of the places that are difficult to map in the genome and help you to identify some types of structural variants. Um, and so these are uh, technologies like 10x genomics and Moleculo and the complete genomics long fragment read technology. Um, and finally, we have a little bit of Oxford nanopore sequencing. Uh, this is still being actively developed, and we don't really have high high coverage of it at this point, but we have at least some sample data from them. Um, and then we have lots of different short read technologies, including really high coverage data, um, also some longer distance information from mate pair data. Um, and we've, our approach for um, developing these data is that as soon as we um, generate the data, we release it publicly. Um, we allow anyone who wants to, to analyze these data and publish on them if they want to. And that's helped to really generate a lot of interest in the community in, um, in helping to analyze these data and um, doing sort of crowdsourcing the analysis of all of these data. Uh, and so to help coordinate all of these different analyses, we formed an analysis group. Um, and the goal of this group is really to establish and distribute a set of authoritative benchmark variant calls. And instead of just the small variants that we developed before, we want to do it for all variant types and sizes, um, as well as the homozygous reference regions of the genome on these um, PGP trios. Uh, and so we have a number of different um, groups that are working within this. So there are people that are working on making the SNP and Indel calls and integrating the different data sets together. Um, there are people that are working on de novo assembly of these data so that uh, particularly the PAC bio data and the bio nano data can be used to do de novo assemblies of human genomes. And this is an active area of research. Um, and it also can be really useful for structural variant calling, especially for larger types of insertions that can occur in the genome. Um, probably the largest group that we have are a variety of people developing structural variants um, for the genome. And the, we have candidate calls being generated by over 15 groups with over 20 different algorithms and from six different data sets. Um, and then we're exploring a variety of different integration methods. So this is. Um, an active area of discussion and research for us to try to really understand how do we integrate these calls together. And we might be able to use some similar methods to what we use for small variants, but there needs to be a lot of new methods development for structural variants. Uh, we're also doing some other analyses, like trying to get longer range phasing information, because some of these new technologies, like 10x and the Complete Genomics LFR, can be used to do that analysis. Um, and we're still working on trying to find some integration methods that we can use to develop high confidence calls. 
Um, and then these data, even though we, we really didn't have methylation analysis as the main goal of the Genome in a Bottle Consortium, these data can be useful for that. And so there are uh, some people that are really working on trying to use the PacBio data or special Illumina libraries to make methylation calls uh, uh, for these genomes. Uh, we have a variety of different documents that we've developed to, um, to uh, sort of outline how we organize everything, and I'd encourage you to take a look at them if you're interested. And we've been collecting the data and the analyses on our FTP site so that people can um, work together and compare the results to each other, um, and we're uh, actively recruiting people to help with the work as well. Uh, so some uh, preliminary results that people have gotten, um, this, these are for doing de novo assemblies, um, where they've either taken just the sun, which is eight, we call HG002, um, and tried to do a de novo assembly of the PacBio reads and combined it with the BioNano data. Um, and they were able to really get very long uh, scaffolds, and so uh, these are 22.7 megabases, meaning uh, uh, with N50, and so that means that at least 50% of the genome is covered by scaffolds that are 22.7 megabases or higher. Um, and this is really almost comparable to what was done as part of the Human Genome Project, which took uh, tens of years and um, I think it was hundreds of millions of dollars to really complete, and so um, it's, that it doesn't reach into all of the difficult regions that the Human Genome Project did, but it's really impressive that the, with these new data sets, um, it can be done much more cheaply than it could in the past um, and much more quickly also. Um, the other thing that they've done is trying to um, assemble the entire family together, and so they, they've even gotten longer contigs by combining all of the data together. Uh, We've also been working on structural variation, and so this is the process that we've developed, and it's really in, at, we're in the middle of it right now. And so we've, we've had a variety of different candidate calls that have been developed by a lot of different groups, and we've been comparing and evaluating the calls using a few different methods um, that can be used to take a candidate region where you think there might be a structural variant and go back and see what's the evidence for this structural variant in the different technologies. And uh, that, that helps to say, helps you to see whether uh, this is just an artifact of a particular technology or analysis method or if this might actually be a true structural variant because it's detected across multiple methods and technologies. Uh, so we've been integrating these um, calls and we're, we're planning to sort of help to manually inspect a lot of these calls. So one of the things we've learned is that um, it's, it's often useful to go in and actually look at the raw data from these different technologies to understand what the true answer is. Um, because sometimes these bioinformatics algorithms, even though they might work well as a whole, there might be particular types of things where they will get the answer wrong due to an artifact in, in how they're analyzing the data or because it's a really difficult region of the genome. Um, and so we're um, sort of working on planning that now and, um, and trying to develop methods that we can use to develop high confidence structural variant calls that people can use to assess performance. Uh, some of the preliminary analyses that we've done are just looking at the number of calls that overlap between different methods, and I won't go into these in detail, but the idea is that we, we want to see how many different callers will call a particular structural variant, um, and how many of the calls are called by one caller, or two callers, or three callers, or even more. Um, and then also looking by technology, how many calls you, we get from each technology from the different callers. Um, and trying to understand the quality of the calls from that and how much concordance there is between the calls to start. Um, and then we've also been looking at some of these integrative methods, um, but two, two methods that try to integrate multiple sources of information are MetaSV and Parliament, and we generally get about 80% agreement between them for deletions, which was, was actually sort of surprisingly uh, concordant, um, but there still are a lot of calls that are uh, only in one call set or the other, and it's also possible even if they agree, there might be some places where they um, are incorrect. Uh, another resource that we've been developing as part of this um, is a GitHub site that describes the data that we've collected for these genomes, and um, this will help people to easily find our data when they want to. 
um, to either run analyses themselves or, um, or develop new methods um, that on a particular type of data. Um, and we, we have a variety of different information that they can access there. Um, and then finally, I want to talk about some of the work we've been doing on benchmarking. So after we develop these high confidence calls, how do you compare your answer to ours and what are the different types of artifacts that you can, uh, that can occur when you do that? Um, and so one of the things that needed to be worked out was developing standardized definitions for performance metrics like true positive and false positive and false negative because it's not straightforward um, what they actually mean in a genome sequencing context. Um, the other thing we've been working on is developing sophisticated benchmarking tools um, that are able to handle some of the different representations that people can have of variants. Um, and finally, we've been developing some standardized files that describe regions of the genome that might be difficult to sequence for one reason or the other. And so this helps you to understand whether you're doing well or poorly for particular types of sequence regions of the genome. This particularly he, um, looks at that there were higher false positive rates at the tandem repeat regions of the genome than there are in the rest of the genome in a particular data set. Uh, so we've been uh, developing some definitions for the performance metrics. Um, and so one of the things that we've decided to do is that actually instead of having just one way of defining true positive, false positive, and false negative, and true negative, um, we thought it probably would be useful to have multiple ways to define them depending on how stringent you want the match to be. Um, and so, for example, if you want just a loose match, it can be a true positive. If, if it's anywhere close to a true variant, then we'll consider it a true positive, even if it, they're not actually calling the correct variant. Um, you can also say if, that it's an allele match. So this is, even if you don't call the correct genotype at that location, you, you call the correct variant, and so we'll give you credit. Um, the genotype match requires that you get the right genotype, and then the phasing match requires that you also get the phasing correct in that region. Um, and one of the things to recognize that we still haven't worked out completely is that true negatives are difficult to define because normally your negatives really are all of the variants that you, you didn't detect and weren't in the genome, and there are an infinite number of potential variants that could occur in a genome. And so we sort of have to come up with a new definition for what we mean by true negative, or, or maybe we don't even want to use true negative as a term anymore for uh, genome sequencing. Uh, but it can be hard for regulatory processes because often this is required in the regulations. Uh, the other types of things that we've been looking at are where there are different combinations of genotypes where you have uh, uh, different alleles in the truth and the call set, and you have to decide whether you classify these as true positives or false positives or false negatives. And so we've been making these tables to really clarify um, which category these should go in. Um, and then you, there are also places in the genome where some callers will say, I don't know what the answer is at that location. And so we have to decide how we handle that, whether those should be counted as uh, false negatives or whether they should be put in a different category. And, um, and so we've been trying to work out which the, what the category should be for these. Uh, we've, uh, as part of this process for developing tools for doing benchmarking, we've uh, uh, developed this architecture where you first have a comparison engine that compares your truth variant call file to your query variant call file. Um, and you can use any of the variety of different comparison tools that we're developing for that. Um, and you get an intermediate file that describes um, true positives, false positives, and false negatives, and also says how close the match was at that location. And that allows this quantify tool then to, to actually count how many true positives, false positives, false negatives you have um, based on whatever definition you tell them um, you want. And then you could also input stratification files into that so that you can say, I do this well in this type of repeat and this well in a different type of repeat. Or, um, and you can get a new VCF file out of that and also the counts of the different uh, metrics. Uh, one of the important things to recognize is that um, 
we're really focused in Genome in a Bottle on developing particular types of approaches to benchmarking variant calling, but there are lots of other potential approaches to benchmarking variant calling. And uh, uh, if you're a clinical lab going through the regulatory process or trying to show that you're doing a good job, you really have to do a variety of different approaches rather than uh, just using reference materials like we've developed. And so well-characterized whole genome reference materials is one approach that I've been focusing on here, but you might also want many different samples that are characterized in clinically relevant regions. So our samples don't necessarily have the variants that cause uh, particular diseases in them. And um, if you say that you can detect a particular clinical variant that's really common, you, you might want to find a sample that actually has that variant in it so that you can show that you detect it. Um, and the other issue uh, with our reference materials is that they don't necessarily have a lot of difficult variants in clinical, re clinically relevant regions. Um, and so if you're only targeting particular regions, you might not have any examples of difficult variants, then, so you can't show that you do well for these difficult variants. Um, Another approach to that problem is to develop synthetic DNA spike-ins. So these might be synthetic DNA constructs you've generated that have a particular variant in them. Um, and then you can add them to you, a reference material sample, and so you can see whether you detect the variant that's in these spike-ins. Um, and that way you could add lots of different variants to the sample and um, see whether you can detect uh, these, this wide variety of different types of variants. Um, another approach to that is also developing cell lines with engineered mutations. So you can actually engineer cell lines now where you change their genome at, at a particular location. That's another approach to putting in clinically relevant variants. Um, and then there are a variety of methods that are based on simulated data or sort of modifying things bioinformatically. And um, there are strengths and weaknesses to using simulated data. Um, because it's often hard to really mimic what's, what's really in the genome. Um, and so you can, actually, you can simulate the reads themselves and try to model the errors as best you can, um, but you could also modify real reads that come from a sequencing instrument and, and insert variants in the reads. Um, or you can even just use re the real reads uh, that come from the instrument and modify the reference genome instead to, so that the reads should have a variant compared to the reference genome. Um, and people are exploring these, the, a variety of these different methods to look at different aspects of how well you're doing variant calling. Um, and another approach is that a lot of the clinical labs or research labs will m analyze many samples over time. And so you can, uh, you can also just confirm uh, variants that you call and see with some other technology and see whether you're calling them correctly. Uh, so there are also a few different, few challenges in benchmarking small variant calling, especially with our reference materials. Um, so the sort of general problem is that it's really difficult to do robust benchmarking of tests that are designed to detect many analytes. So for example, genome sequencing assays are designed to detect many different variants. A whole genome sequencing assay detects millions of variants in the genome. And so how do you do benchmarking of, of a test that can detect so many different things and some things that you don't even know exist yet. Um, and uh, so this is a, a sort of general problem that doesn't only apply to genome sequencing, but applies to a lot of other new types of tests that people are developing uh, that detest many, detect many things at the same time. Um, it's also easiest to benchmark only within the high confidence bed file. So look only inside our high confidence regions and compare to your calls to ours. Um, but these, these benchmark calls and regions tend to be biased towards the easier variants and the easier regions of the genome. Uh, and this is just because we're not able to make high confidence benchmark calls in the more difficult parts of the genome. And some clinical tests are actually enriched for difficult sites. And so if you're benchmarking against our calls, you're really not getting a good representation of how well you do on variants in general that you detect clinically. Um, we also still always recommend that you manually inspect a subset of false positives and false negatives because we found that often some of these false positives and false negatives are not actually false positives and false negatives. And that can be for a wide variety of different reasons, um, but uh, it can be just because the comparison tool isn't able to take the different representations into account. It can be sometimes because our benchmark is incorrect because we know that we're not completely perfect in the, even within our high confidence regions. 
Um, and it, this also, even if they are real false positives and false negatives, it helps you to understand why you're getting the incorrect call at that location. Uh, the other thing that's important that's related to some of these other points is that stratification by variant type and region is important. So you might do really well for easy SNPs and easy regions of the genome, but you might not do well for larger insertions or deletions or more difficult regions of the genome. Um, and then also something that people often forget to do or don't think to do is that you really should be calculating confidence intervals on performance metrics. So if you're only detecting 10 variants and you get one false positive, or even if you get zero false positives and zero false negatives, but you only detect 10 variants, your confidence interval around your sensitivity and specificity is actually quite large in that case. And so it's important to calculate these confidence intervals. Um, some particular challenges when you're trying to benchmark structural variant calling that are different from the small variant calling that we've been focused on is, well, first, how do you establish benchmark calls for difficult regions? Uh, even establishing benchmark calls in easy regions is still fairly hard for SVs right now. Um, but a lot of structural variants occur in more difficult regions of the genome because the homology between different regions of the genome causes the structural variant. And so how do you establish benchmark calls in those regions so that people can accurately understand how well they're detecting them? Um, also, for the small variants, we've been able to define regions where we think there are not small variants, but it's not clear how you do that for structural variation, um, that we might be able to say it for some types of structural variants, but there probably are certain types of structural variants that just won't be seen by current technologies, and so we can't really definitively say that there's no uh, structural variant there. Um, and then finally, similarly to how we have multiple dimensions of accuracy for small variants, where you might have the genotype correct, or you might have the variant call correct, but not the genotype correct, um, for structural variants, that becomes an even larger space where you can say, um, you've predicted that a structural variant is there, but you don't actually know what it is, or you might predict the wrong one, um, but maybe that's good enough for, um, for whatever purpose you have. Um, you might predict the type of structural variant, but not really predict the size or the breakpoint accurately. Um, you might predict the size correctly, but not the exact breakpoints perfectly. Um, you might predict the breakpoints perfectly, but then not actually have the exact sequence that occurs in there. So maybe you have, uh, you, you know exactly where an insertion occurs, but you don't actually know what, what the inserted bases are at that location because it's too long or because um, your technology doesn't allow you to do that. Um, and then finally, sort of the highest level is that you actually predict the exact sequence in that location and you get the genotype correct and everything. Um, so there are a lot of challenges here to be worked out, and this is an active area of discussion within Genome in a Bottle and, um, and in a lot of other uh, places where people are trying to develop these structural variant colors and trying to understand um, the accuracy of them. Uh, so finally, I'd like to acknowledge um, that the FDA um, helped to fund some of this work that, that we're doing. So uh, even though we're not a regulatory agency at NIST, um, we do provide tools that can be used as part of the regulatory process and do, so, do regulatory science to really understand how you can assess accuracy. Um, and so I'd like to acknowledge them and some help from a lot of discussions with people there. Um, and also, many members of the Genome in a Bottle Consortium have helped with different aspects of this work. Um, and we always are welcoming new members. And so um, you're, if you're interested in staying in touch with what we're doing, you can sign up for email newsletters. Um, and we have a large variety of people on our steering committee that have helped us to make decisions. Um, and I'll end with a slide that um, describes uh, where you can go if you're interested in finding more information about um, what we do in Genome in a Bottle or in the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. Um, we also hold workshops twice a year um, at Stanford University and at NIST in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions by email as well. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, talk about this and, um, and hope that uh, uh, you're very welcome to participate in, in what we're doing.